Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the session on resetting digital currencies. The theme of this year's forum, as you know, is a crucial year to rebuild trust. And of course, for those of you working in the digital currency community, it has indeed felt like every year has been a crucial year to build trust. My name is Elizabeth Rossiello, and I am the founder and CEO of AZA. We are the largest non-bank currency broker in Africa, and I was a technology pioneer at the World Economic Forum for the last forum. We were the first company to make a market for digital currencies in 2013 in Africa. So I have not only worked with the asset class and the technology where trust has been scarce, to say the least, but also in a geography that has suffered from de-risking in the global banking sector quite severely which is also resulting from a lack of trust. Christine Lagarde spoke extensively about the de-risking and how that affects the financial system globally at the last forum. But this Monday, the forum's daily theme is designing cohesive, sustainable, and resilient economic systems. So I look forward to this conversation where we can discuss how, and more importantly, when our digital currencies going to be part of the sustainable and resilient economic system. It will be important to hear from stakeholders on all sides of the topic. Clearly, as a technology startup in a frontier geography, digital currencies are part of my reality and the reality of my customers. But I acknowledge my experience is still not that of the majority. We are lucky today to hear from both the public and private sector, the regulatory and investment perspective, the for-profit retail and development sides of the square. And the timing could not be better. Just last week, Janet Yellen, the U.S. Treasury Secretary, announcing the old fears about cryptocurrencies being used mainly for criminal transactions. But at the same time, we have a retail and institutional investor bull market for cryptocurrencies, driving the price of some to an all-time high close to $40,000. On the policy side, we have continued work being done even throughout 2020 when we saw COVID-19 dominate. The central bank um, digital currency um, memo that came out from the Bank of England in March 2020, and of course, Governor Bailey's September 2020 speech on the topic in support of innovation, caution, and moving forward together. So before we get into this great discussion today with our panelists, let's just take a minute and talk about the structure of today's discussion. The first 30 minutes will be a public forum and all comments will be open to the public. Um, we have Sheila Warren, the head of blockchain, digital assets and data policy at the World Economic Forum, going to come on for the second 30 minutes where we'll be able to have a question and answer session by invite only for the participants who are part of um, the forum. So let's get to our panel. The first panelist, um, and we're going to give a, a quite a brief introduction. Of course, all of our panelists have an esteemed background in history, but let's just stick to the introduction today. So we have Her Majesty Queen Maxima of the Netherlands, the United Nations Secretary General's Special Advocate for Inclusive Finance for Development. Welcome, Your Majesty. We'll have Andrew Bailey, the governor of the Bank of England. Welcome, governor. We have Hikmet Ersek, the president and chief executive officer and director of the Western Union Company. And finally, but last but not least, Glenn Hutchins, chairman of North Island Ventures, a crypto venture capital investment fund, as well as the co-founder of Silver Lake. So let's get to the discussion. The first question will go to Her Majesty Queen Maxima of the Netherlands, the United Nations Secretary General's Special Advocate for Inclusive Finance for Development. So Your Majesty, let's put this topic into context. Can you share any historical examples that come to mind that could provide us with some lessons for the design and governance of digital currencies? Thank you very much, first of all, for having us here and uh, you know, being able to discuss this very important issue. Uh, which is very much part of the future of all of us and very important for financial inclusion. And talking about history, I mean, we're in Holland. <laughs> uh, I would say the first sort of neo central bank was uh, probably here from 1609 to 1820, the Bank of Amsterdam. If you can imagine all these traders in the golden age, they were actually were handling different coins and different uh, uh, letters, and uh, there was a lot of confusion about it. So they actually set up the Bank of Amsterdam and they put themselves. The first, I would actually say, early stable coin. 
So they actually put their gold and their, their, their silver and they created this stable coin. Um, it, of course, made papers much cheap, cheaper. Um, they had a single currency, finally, and they made it much easier in handling coins. Now, this, of course, with trade, it flourished around the world, and the Gilder kept on growing all around Europe and the world. Now, at one point, uh, this was quite rigid, so they had to go into a much more flexible uh, role of it. They have to not only um, have the small payments, but also give liquidity to the much bigger payments, and also acting as a lender of last resort during crises. And, of course, always trying to maintain the stable value of the Gilder. So these are the two issues that are very important. Number one, the design of the stable and all the features therein to actually make it, you know, stable, flexible, and actually giving the land of last resort, etc. And the other issue is the governance, because as the bank started to give much more credit and uh, taking deposits, it was actually the governance or the Bank of Amsterdam that gave the trust, not so much. Uh, basically, the, the assets that were backing uh, this gilder. So, um, so that's extremely uh, important to realize that uh, we've actually go went through these uh, situations. And what is actually very important is that um, what happened in the end is that the and going back to the governance issue is that the Bank of Amsterdam they were actually very chummy with some of the traders and they overstretched their indebtedness to some of the traders and of course that meant the fall of the um, Gilder at that point in which the Bank of England took over as a European I would say currency of the day which basically gave us again um, how important the governance on a on a, on a stable yeah. currency uh, how design is uh, that it has to be has to be stable but at the same time flexible enough and it has to be able to provide sufficient liquidity so um and the last thing is some kind of fiscal backing because that's actually what happened with the bank of amsterdam when their runs started going there was no merchant that wanted to even put more capital there to really make the situation be stabilized so um, maybe some of the uh, lessons learned from history for us to uh, maybe apply in the future on any new types of currencies that come along. Interesting. The first stable coin uh, from Amsterdam. So we'll be referring to also uh, CBDC, so central bank digital currencies, and we talk about um, some of the things you mentioned going forward in this discussion. It's interesting to, to hear from a historical contest. Um, I'm, I'd be interested for the next panelist to discuss also whether the centralized versus decentralized aspect uh, of what you just mentioned. So we, this next question is for Governor Bailey and Glenn Hutchins. Um, who perhaps might have the same the same point of view on this, but let's hear it. Are we here to stay now with digital currencies as part of the financial ecosystem? I mean, there are definitely ad advocates strongly believing this and some on the opposite side. Has, but there has there been a turning point over the last one to two years, for instance, from COVID-19 or with the popularity of some cryptocurrencies? Has sentiment turned a corner for those of us who have been involved in technology for seven years, we've seen sentiment ping pong back and forth and where are we now with the thinking on how digital currency takes its place in the financial system and i and i'd love to hear your your perspective not just on cbdc's but on other forms of digital currencies governor bailey would you like to start us off yes um, i mean thank you and i think i mean first of all i think that the, the lessons of history are fascinating here i think the answer to the to your question is are we you know are we here to stay is for digital innovation and payments yes I mean, there's been huge innovation in payments in recent years, and rightly so, but we still have some very big gaps to fill. Um, you know, cross-border remittances, cross-border payments being the obvious one where the cost of making payments is too high. Now, are we here to stay in terms of digital innovation? Yes, but what I think the, history, the lessons of history are so fascinating, as Green Massima laid them out, is have we landed on what I would call the design governance uh, and arrangements for what I might call a sort of a, a you know, a, a lasting digital currency. No, I don't think we're there yet, uh, honestly. Um, I don't think cryptocurrencies as originally formulated are, are it. What, because I think that as, as, as the history shows us, the whole question of people having assurance that their payments are going to be made in something with stable value 
which as the history lesson says, ultimately links back to what we call fiat currency, which is a link to the state. Now you can, you can organize that, I think, in quite a few ways, and here's where the innovation comes in. And that's why we're, you know, we're right still to debate stablecoin, we're right to debate central bank digital currency. Those issues, I think, are very much up for grabs, and I'm sure we'll be discussing them today. But is digital innovation here to stay? Yes, I think my, my presumption is, and my best guess is, yes, it is, and it should be, because, of, as I said, we've, we've got challenges, big challenges still to solve where it should help us. It'll be interesting to hear also, you know, what is the designated lifespan of the currency in 2020 and going forward? Will it, is it 100 years, 200 years? What will that lifespan look like? Glenn, do you want to comment? Yeah, let me uh, take up where you, or rather than repeat what Andrew said, which I thought was um, spot on, take up where you uh, alluded to digital currencies and other digital currencies. Take a step back for a moment. The, the currency is one, is one of three elements that are the fundamental innovation here. The other two are the blockchain and the protocol, in this case, the Bitcoin protocol. Um, they work together in a way that makes them inseparable. If you analogize it to a railroad, uh, the token or coin is the boxcar, the blockchain is the cargo manifest, and the protocol are the rails. Um, and so that's kind of how you think about it. To talk about coins just by themselves, without talking about protocols, or the accounting uh, ledgers kind of really only understands part of the problem. So it's like talking about a... Uh, a battery, but not the whole um, uh, internal combustion engine. Um, the, uh, that's point one. Point two is as, as we develop the, the use, the, what, what's gonna be driven here, all of this can be driven by use cases that consumers find useful. Uh, and then that will allow the adoption of those technologies and adoption of those coins that are associated with the technologies. So the first, um, like, you know, for instance, I should, um, Disclose that I'm an investor in Elizabeth's company, have been there for a happy investor for years. Uh, and so she's found a use case. Uh, and the original use cases for the tokens were in fact payments. So people talk about payments. Uh, but then there, when Ethereum was created, a different kind of token, a different solution, that became the use case there became smart contracts. Uh, and opened up a whole new way of using this digital currency technology uh, and a whole new set of products can be created around that. And it, we're now evolving into each um, particular company or each particular network that's created with a set of use cases has its own token. So we're, we're at a place now where there are gonna be a proliferation of uh, tokens run on net networks based upon certain protocols. And so there, there will be multiple tokens that'll be used. And my guess is, and those will be driven by the use cases that we present to consumers to use those tokens. And then they'll come back, in my view, into things like protocol, into things like Bitcoin and stable coins for purposes of being a store of value. Is that so like the EU before the euro? Sorry? Well, then, is that like uh, Europe before the euro with all of our national currencies with a lot of similarities and fungibility? Sort of, but it's also like, um, imagine it's more like, uh, uh, another way of look, looking at it is more like if you're a uh, artist and you own the rights to a song or to a movie, each time that movie is created or you or send the movie is shown, you get paid a little bit and it becomes more valuable the more people watch the movie. Tokens will grow in value as the network that they're attached to has more use cases. Uh, and then those tokens will themselves be more valuable. And since, but since they're multiplicative around the networks, they'll need something to come back into stable coins, Bitcoin and fiat currency. So we're already setting the scene here with a very different, a uh, large spectrum of options where we have fewer currencies that have a lot more trust and a lot more buy-in to a, a place which, uh, a land where Glenn is describing of um, not only multiple currencies, but reissuance of the same currencies, maybe per transaction or per use case. So it's a, a quite a large spectrum here that we still have to explore. Let's look at it from the, the for-profit, the retail perspective with Hikmet. How specifically is the arrival of digital currencies? And as we've seen, it's hard to just lump together all digital currencies. It's the technology, it's the actual issuance. Um, how specifically is the arrival of this technology affecting your current or future strategy, specifically at the Western Union, um, perhaps with respect to product or a business model, regulatory approach? And I know we've been in touch over the years, and it's, it's interesting to see how the sector, and I work also in remittances, has evolved. We definitely haven't seen majority buy-in, but we, we have seen longevity. So how is it affecting um, 
a company of your scale? Well, um, Elizabeth, I think, uh, first of all, at Western Union, we are very excited about the innovation as we go to our own digitalization, own innovation, and um, really adopting our, our systems to the new environment. But uh, as Glenn mentioned earlier, use cases do matter. And uh, use cases uh, do matter because, you know, don't forget that there are about, uh, when we talk about uh, cryptocurrency or digital currency, uh, there are about 8 billion people worldwide. They want to be a part of a payment system. They want to be part of the global economy. And uh, when we talk about digital currencies, we should not talk about exclusivity. We should talk about inclusivity. And inclusive, uh, inclusive currencies will make the success. And, you know, uh, and then words and definitions matter. We are talking here about fiat currency, digital currency, e-money, stable coin, uh, cryptocurrency, virtual currencies. And these are all uh, different terms, actually, different de definitions for different use cases. Uh, and that's important when we talk about digital currency. We really have to understand which digital currency, currency serves which use, use cases. We at Western Union, obviously, serve about 200 million customers worldwide uh, in 200 countries. And from different, with different currencies, we in every, every second, we kind of uh, process uh, 21 transactions, 137 currencies. And um, as uh, her Majesty Queen Maxima mentioned that that was first stable coin was at Netherlands, Central Bank of Netherlands. But I can tell you also that, uh, uh, you know, when we settle that currencies on 137 currency, we have a kind of a Wu coin, West Union coin, which we translate one currency to another currency immediately, and we keep the stable currency in the middle. And we do that 21 times every second. So I think that what I'm coming back, its definitions are extremely important. And at West Union, we really look at definition use cases. And you know, Elizabeth, very well, when you are in Africa, when you talk about certain use cases and the certain use cases. And a certain use case in, in, in New York, maybe, or in Geneva, it's different than a certain use case in, in Cairo uh, or in Uganda in Gulu. And these are big differences, and we have to understand that one. And that's what West Union tries to really combine that and really serve about um, um, customers, millions of customers in 200 countries with different needs. And it's complex. As um, Governor mentioned, it has to be regulated. <laughs> Um, you know, that's funny to hear it maybe from a CEO, which is entrepreneurial, which drives it, right? But in that case, the regulations is really in favor of people, in favor of consumers, and in favor of co corporations like West Union. Interesting. So to date, the West Union has found a use case internally, operationally, um, perhaps using some of the technology for efficiency for operations. And I I'm dying to ask you some questions in the second half, specifically sure. about you know, Nigeria, the, one of the largest remittance markets in Africa, which has enough trouble with its own currency, fiat currency in the US dollar and, ex and trying to find fungibility and accessibility for that and liquidity there. So how can we even begin to go into the, the spectrum of digital currencies when we're still struggling with monetary policy for remittances in, in local currency? We'll talk about that one later. So the next question is about, you know, what are we still afraid of um, in, in venture capital speak? What keeps you up at night? And um, going to your majesty and, and then later in Glenn Hutchins, what is your biggest concern still about digital currency technology or aspects of it? Are we still um, in the place where we've been earlier in the cycle where, you know, Janet Yellen describes fear about criminal activity? Are we still there or how we move forward? What are we still worried about? Yeah, well, first of all, um, I, I, my work predominantly has been centered on trying to increase financial inclusion across the world. Fantastic, 2.5 billion people have actually got into the system in the last uh, 11 years. Really fantastic progress, mostly in the back of mobile money. Um, so we're in for innovation. So let me start by saying that. The issue is whether stable coins or whatever uh, uh, um, digital currency will promote greater financial inclusion, will um, be used by the poor. So I like the fact that you know, user cases do matter. And that the poor people can actually benefit from it. Um, number, I would mention two things that maybe are going to be by technology advanced, but two things that are still very, very important are, first of all, speed and lack of technology. 
for the ball. In the case of speed, if I see Bitcoin, it actually does a maximum of seven transactions per second, whereas mobile money is doing about 900 transactions per second. So in a situation where you're actually bringing new people into this financial service, and they really need to have trust and you know, having this instant thing of actually paying or sending the money to your mother, and your mother after that day or back for 10 minutes haven't really got it, this, you know, you're gonna send it again. This is not very good in building trust. So that's one thing that's very important. And certainly very important for the digital uh, retail transactions. Because if we want to get people out of cash into you know, transacting digitally, this has to be a very, very fast, very quick uh, type of retail transaction as well. Um, and one thing is, is the, um, when I say what it takes too long, is sometimes you know, when you get the confirmation, the payment went through, that actually leaves people sort of in this trust issue. But you know, you can actually say, well, maybe the speed can go up. And the speed issue is, of course, because you are doing the crypto part of the blockchain. You don't need to have the, you know, the blockchain part because you have a center that's going to have a digital currency. So that's also in the design. The other issue is a lack of technology. Most of the digital currencies do depend still on smartphones. And I have to say that 60% of sub Saharan Africa uh, people have actually uh, feature phones. And, uh, about a half of all the transfers are actually done through feature phones in all emerging markets. So, you know, um, we are still not there unless we actually promote some type of digital currency that can be handled by a feature phone. It's going to take a long time until people can afford this kind of currency. So that's something, you know, I would also like to stress. Um, then in the issue of cross-border payments, it's very nice that um, Western Union is here present today because we know that cross-border payments is the most promising part of financial inclusion. It makes that today it's just so expensive uh, to send money to your loved ones abroad, and uh, the, the, the costs are high, it's actually complicated, etc. But even if, I mean, I'm, even if the emitter of the stable coin, issuer, would actually charge you zero, I still am aware where the payments or the, or the the tariffs, the hidden tariffs would actually be. Because I have to put my salary into the digital currency, and I send it to my family, probably in a hard currency, and then it goes, my family has to extract it again and take it out. So these in and entry and exit points, what is going to be that difference between this buy and sell? So transparency along the road will be extremely important. And there's also, I think for financial inclusion, I like the fact that you know you said the words and definitions do matter because the design does it all. Um, if it is only designed as a medium of exchange, it will have some very positive effects. But if it is designed as a store of value, it will have other effects. If it is interesting bearing, um, we might end up having less intermediation because I mean that money goes to the digital currency, and then banks have less money to actually lend to a SMEs which is another part of the of group of people that I worry about. If it is encrypted by using blockchain, this is the point. You know, how much electricity do you need to have? It becomes unsustainable. I mean, uh, we're trying to calculate some countries, how much do they actually need for them to actually have a type of Bitcoin in their own country? Um, but also the processing might be have to be done by large conglomerates. Once, I mean, that is actually abroad. Want the currency to be abroad? Um, and then if you decide for a centralized system, we've actually seen countries like Bahamas, you know, that also has privacy issues. Um, it might be very fast, it's done with real central bank, but then you have to even have privacy to be um, looked into. So these are some of the issues, and I didn't even talk about the macroeconomic issues, sovereignty issues, etc. But uh, um, these are the issues that from a financial inclusion perspective were on this paper. Definitely. And, I'm, and it's interesting to hear um, your perspective on, you know, waiting for the full P2P retail um, effectiveness of a currency. You know, we, we use digital currencies for the wholesale part, and then we use the money for distribution. So, you know, removing some parts of the vertical or innovating in some parts of the vertical and keeping others. Because as you said, it's, it's difficult right now to go completely end-to-end -end with something. But there's a lot of efficiency to the gain, you know, up the vertical on the wholesale front. Glenn, how do you see this? What are you so afraid of at night when you, when you go to sleep thinking about this? Uh, well, I'm worried about two, uh, primarily about uh, companies building products that can have, uh, build, around which you can build profitable businesses. 
uh, and a little bit of regulatory piece, which we can come back to in a minute. But on the first, the arc of creation of technology companies goes from math problem to math solution to engineering problem to engineering solution to product creation to business model uh, construction around the, the product to company formation around the business model. Um, and in the digital currency world, we have the, the math problem is, of course, the business dean general's problem. The Bitcoin was the solution to the math problem. We spent much of the last five years taking that solution and trying to engineer products around it. And we sort of have solved a lot, but not all the problems that came out of that. Uh, and now we're at the point where we're actually designing products and trying to see if they find business models. And so what I spend most of my time worrying about is can we construct business models around some of these cool products that are being created, as you've done, uh, inside your company, can we do that um, uh, across across the industry? That's the where the industry is in this development. It's where I spend most of my time um, working. Um, yeah. Right? Uh, you, you know what I'm talking about. Um, secondly, I would say that on the regulatory front, I think it's very important. I've uh, emphasized enormously uh, as I've entered into this industry um, that it needs to work inside a regulated regulated environment. Uh, both from the central bank point of view and the securities uh, um, industry point of view in the United States, that would be the Fed and the SEC. Um, and, um, but the regulators also need to understand that they need to construct a, to construct a set of regulations that fit this new industry, uh, just the way that we construct a set of regulations that uh, Queen was talking about that fit those new currency industries and the way we you know, currencies and then the way we later created regulations to fit something brand new called stocks. We can't take the old regulatory model and put it on top of this. Um, and my friend Ken Rogoff, professor at Harvard, former uh, chief uh, economist at the IMF, in his book, The Curse of Cash, writes that um, 80 to 90 percent of all U.S. $100 bills are used in, for uh, organized crime and tax evasion. The, the single largest uh, vector along which organized crime operates is U.S. $100 bills. The uh, income, because they are um, untraceable, essentially and they're fungible and people can use them anywhere they want. Uh, the Bitcoin in contrast uh, leaves a permanent auditable, auditable record called the blockchain. And that's why almost all the Bitcoin criminals are caught because they're, they leave footprints that are permanent and, and auditable. And most people from law enforcement understand this. It's a consequence, this is just an example, as a consequence of which I think it's wrong to say that Bitcoin transactions are primarily used for uh, uh, in criminal uh, enterprises. Because if you actually look at the use statistics uh, right now, that's just fundamentally wrong. And so I think those sort of understandings of kind of where this, what happens in this industry and how it operates, how it compares to the economy that we're, we're superseding, need to be uh, overcome with a fair amount of education. So that's the second thing I worry about. Interesting. Um, so we hear also, you know, I, I agree with you. A lot of the business models are hybrid models, you know, because it is still difficult to go end to end. Um, but I think, I hope we have turned the corner on the criminal activity argument because there is so much innovation and it has been, you know, almost a decade of, of innovating in that space. But how do you regulate something so innovative when it can be argued that we haven't mastered regulation on the traditional financial sector? And certainly uh, as part of the fintech community, um, there's a lot of complaints in the, in the fintech regulation that it's not keeping up to pace with innovation. So it seems, you know, an insurmountable task. How, uh, and I'll ask this directly to Governor Bailey um, and again to Hikmet, how do you regulate something like this that's, you know, beyond, a, beyond the curve of innovation that we've seen before? and comes in so many different forms, as your, Her Majesty has discussed. Um, how do you go about balancing all of the factors and considerations involved in regulation, and specifically seeing as this is a global innovation, and once you become digital, it is essentially cross-border, how does that work between um, regulatory jurisdictions? You know, I, I have entities in three continents, and every regulator is different. So where do we even begin? Governor Bailey? Well, I, start, I think we begin actually, and the history guides us here, by defining where the public interest lies. Because that's what regulation is about. It's about serving the public interest. So I think the public interest here, I'll pick out three things quickly. One, stability of value. I think the public interest for payments, for, the, for, the, for facilitating of payments, relies on defining how we have st stability of value. By the way, that stability of value is also important for underpinning interoperability. Second, as we were just talking about, um, how to ensure that, that we can tackle the potential use of financial crime. 
thirdly, and this is the, the this is a big one, I think, that's obviously on you know now coming onto the uh, onto the landscape. The quote, the whole question of, of a privacy standard for access to the personal information that will go with transactions made in any form of digital currency, and how we, you know, what, where the public interest lies in terms of the balance between privacy, and obviously the benefits to the public that come with reduced transactions costs, use, as Her Majesty was saying, use across borders, which I think is hugely important, and a lot of work is going on, by the way, in the international community. So the answer on regulation is, in a way, it's, it's not changed. Define the public interest and then build it out to fit the, fit the context and the technology. But don't think the technology becomes before the public interest. It doesn't. And, and do you see a quick follow-up question here? I can't hold back. Do you see the public interest? <laughs> Um, dividing with the new digital divide in this re in this revolution that we're having here in technology, do we see for the first time in history, or is this maybe history repeating itself, a true divide in what the public interest is in terms of absorbing, uh, utilizing, adoring, um, and implementing technology? I, I, I think at root, no, it doesn't. Um, I think there are always potentially different interpretations of what the public interest was. It may be, if you, as the Majesty was saying, if you go back and look at the Bank of Amsterdam, you may have found different interpretations of the sort of issues that, in a sense, guided its success and its eventual downfall. But ultimately, actually, no, I don't see a fundamental division of the public interest. But, but I think you can go through very noisy periods. And I think, you know, let's take the third example I gave the question of privacy of information and access to personal information. I think you can go through periods when that is hotly debated, rightly so in a way, because we've got to define what the public interest is. But I would be surprised if there was ultimately a fundamental difference of view on where the public interest lies. Hmm. You, you have to come to some of my dinner parties then. <laughs> to hear the oh, you're, no, but you're debating, that's great, you're debating it. <laughs> um. I'm not having any dinner parties during lockdown, I promise, Governor Bailey. Okay, so Hikmet, how do you see this from a business perspective? Do you agree with the governor? Um, are we, are, is it business as usual in terms of creating regulation? Is there something new that we have to consider using this technology? You know, from, as a business leader of a company which transacts so many um, transactions, I don't see regulations are different than innovation. You have to innovate within the regulatory environment. The regulatory environment is in the public interest, obviously, protecting the consumers in our cases. And protecting the consumers means also a, a, a exclude, including a lot of consumers within our system. With that, you have to be very innovative in investing in the regulatory environment. In the last years, uh, West Union has been investing hundreds of millions or billions of dollars in the, in the anti-money laundering on the regulatory environment being active in 200 countries. And by the way, uh, Glenn, I'm not sure if cash is the biggest, uh, biggest, uh, anti biggest laundering environment. I'm not really sure of that because, you know, we know that we are working very close with the regulators in 200 countries and uh, we get admired for catching bad money. <laughs> and we at West Union don't want to have bad money in our system. So the cash, you could put also in a way the way of how you really track the transaction, how you settle the transactions, how you convert the transactions within the environment. And that's something that we uh, really do in that environment. Now, the digital currency environment, Elizabeth, is new, right? It's relatively new. And as I mentioned earlier, the definition and the, and the uh, the words matter, how we define what, what do we regulate in the beginning. Do we regulate the stable coin? Do we regulate the currencies in the, in the front line? Do we, uh, uh, has an impact to the uh, monetary policies? You know, people are even mixing the monetary policies with the anti-money London regulations, which is, yeah. has nothing to do with each other. I think we should start with the monetary policies, which has a big impact of a country. Like we're going to talk about Nigeria in a second, or also countries like Argentina, where the high inflation rates are uh, huge and the automatic uh, switch to another asset is given within the population because they want to have the hard currency, hard currency in, in, uh, you know, in digital currencies. And some countries like Nigeria, the central bank says that you have to switch it to dollars. You can't pay out in Nigerian currencies. So these are, these are more complex environment. And within that environment, I think uh, I agree with Governor Bailey uh, earlier uh, said the 
central banks have to talk to each other also. It's not like, you know, it, we are talking about the regulation of the monetary policies, about the currencies, really controlling how much money is flowing out, flowing in. It's not like only, you know, about, we are not talking about the you know, digital innovation. We are really talking about economical change and inclu uh, economical changes and inclu yeah. inclusive yeah. economy. Wonderful. And on that note, Hickman, thank you so much for wrapping that up, that this is a broader discussion, and we will have to move to the second part of this discussion right now, which will be behind um, somewhat closed doors. And I'd like to hand over the discussion to Sheila Warren to take us further into that second session.